In the 1800s, Sir Richard Owen, founder of the Magnificent Natural History Museum in London, was one of Charles Darwin's associates. And more than that, Owen was Darwin's mentor, his senior, superior, and one of his staunchest adversaries as well. Owen did not accept the concept of evolution from common ancestry. He had very different ideas about the classification of life. He preferred to believe that different kinds of animals were miraculously created out of nothing by God, separate from and unrelated to all other kinds of life, which he described as divine archetypes. So Owen was a creationist, but it wasn't out of ignorance of science, because he was also the world's leading authority on paleontology in his day. Unlike modern creationists, Owen did not deny that a series of geologic ages, each with particular paleofauna, were indicated in the fossil record, because he knew more about that than anyone else ever did. Instead, his understanding of that fact caused him to imagine that God would occasionally create newer and better animals when the old series wore out or died off so that iguanodons were removed and replaced by grazing cattle, pterosaurs were grounded and birds issued in their stead, and theropods were recalled and the wilderness restocked with lions and tigers and bears. And just as with constantly advancing technology and modern manufacturing, each replacement would be an improvement because Owen's god was apparently one who could learn on the job, correcting earlier mistakes and upgrading his designs with the next generation or series. Otherwise, Owen mostly embraced the old Linnaean notion that fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals were all separate creations unrelated to each other and that there was no way to bridge the gaps between these distinctly different animal archetypes. This video series has already shown how these boundaries have been crossed. I remember in episode 14 I pointed out that the transition from what we traditionally thought of as fish to what we colloquially consider to be amphibians took 80 million years and nine clades named so far because there were so many structural changes developed in sequence. Whereas the transition from amphibians to reptiles was a whole lot quicker because it involved little more than the addition of keratinized skin and claws. Richard Owen thought that reptiles and amphibians were essentially the same thing. Even though the amniote egg which distinguishes them is kind of a big deal, Owen somehow overlooked that and a lot of other important fundamental structures favoring a few superficial surface features that were relatively trivial. The big deal for him was the transition from cold-blooded to warm-blooded because he thought that made animals more compassionate. It turns out that both of those transitions, the evolution of birds and of mammals from a common ancestor that Owen would have called a reptile, each took longer than either of the previous stages. At this point in our series, we're still in the late Triassic. There is still no way to know whether any of the dinosaurs around then were warm-blooded yet, but there are two indications that they might be. The line of archosaurs divided between the crew or tarsi being the more primitive type like crocodilians and phytosaurs, for example, and ornithodira. These are the more advanced, and according to their structure, much more energetic. They mostly have hollow bones that are lighter and stronger and are associated with a much more efficient system of respiration. Their bodies are faster, stronger, and better built. So from Owen's perspective, these are the new showroom models replacing last year's clunkers. And this is what disturbed Owen so much. The idea that dinosaurs were more advanced than modern mammals completely ruined his idea of a god who constantly tinkers and improves his designs. Why would God have made such high-performance dinosaurs in the past that are better than the mammals we have now? Owen objected to the idea that birds and mammals could have evolved from mere reptiles, so he tried his best to depict dinosaurs and pterosaurs as if both were just sluggish, cold-blooded lizards. And he even tried to hide or dismiss all the evidence that kept coming up to prove him wrong about that to the point that he was eventually indicted for fraudulently misrepresenting data. This was the birth of creation science. Another trait that may have begun at the root of Ornithodera is pycnofibers, follicular filaments similar to hair. Now, pterosaurs had them early on, and dinosaurs eventually had something like that too, like a downing covering which later turned into feathers. And whenever we see animals covered in an insulation like this, the indication is that they're at least partially homeothermic. And we know that both dinosaurs and pterosaurs were eventually, if not initially, warm-blooded. We just don't know how early that began, and were they both that way right from the beginning, at the crown of Ornithodera? Likewise, therapsids, the mammal-like reptiles, have evidently been warm-blooded for quite a long time already and are now covered in fur which is structurally different than what pterosaurs had and what the earliest of the fluffy dinosaurs eventually had because they evolved separately, independently, and thus differently. 
The first birds didn't appear until the mid-Jurassic, which is quite a wait from where we are in the Triassic. After a couple dozen episodes, we finally come to the very first mammals, represented here by Megazostrodon, a tiny shrew-like critter from about 200 million years ago. The funny thing is, it's still not completely mammal. It should have five sacral vertebrae like you and other modern mammals do, but this one still has three, and it has a couple other primitive cynodont features that are lost in later mammals. We'll talk more about that in the next episode. But the transition from what Richard Owen used to call reptiles to what we would reasonably consider mammals has already occupied the last 10 episodes of this series, showing 19 named clades existing over a period of more than 150 million years, covering pretty much the entire Carboniferous, Permian, and Triassic periods. And if you remember from the last episode, there were already two earlier species than this that were also provisionally considered to be the first mammals, even though they too hadn't met quite all of the criteria yet. How many little increments do we need to see before we can say, okay, that's a mammal now? In these last 10 episodes, we watched the gradual reduction and movement of the bones in the jaw, where the mandible now is just one bone, and a few of those others are now the tiny bones in the inner ear, both uniquely mammalian features. That and the hinge of the jaw has moved from where it is in reptiles to a double tandem hinge for a while because we can move our jaws in ways that reptiles can't. And now our jaw hinges only in the new mammalian position. These are skeletal indicators of mammalia, in addition to the fact that we have milk-producing mammary glands, which is where the name mammal comes from. At the end of every episode, I ask whether you, the viewer, accepts your classification into whatever clade we're talking about, given the criteria we've just listed and gone over. And this is the one instance where I'm sure everyone will be comfortable with the fact that you are a mammal, because we all accept that we are warm-blooded and we have hair and a number of other features inherited from our prehistoric predecessors, including memories of the way we were. <laughs>